This is how God created the world. Imagine, just imagine this is how God created the world. He, he did it on, he does it on a computer. He creates one man as a model, and then he mass produces. He types in, after finishing writing the codes and everything to create the one man, he writes in, he puts in, he tells the computer to duplicate, to do mass duplication. And you know how you want to print. You get to the print page and it says how many copies, and then you put in 10 copies. So God puts in 6 billion, and he presses print or produce or execute. And then all of us are made. We would all essentially be a copy of that one person. We will all essentially be we will all essentially be duplicates of that one person, and we would find out anyone who is not like that person, like an exact replica, is going to be defective. So that's going to be a product that has a factory default uh, defect that has a factory defect, and um, it will be malfunctioning. Imagine, have you seen those, just like how we see in robotic films, you know, those science fiction films where that one robot had a, comp, had a defect and somehow, somehow it had a human side of it and then it decides to start a revolution and it's not measuring up and they're now trying to, they're then trying to terminate this one robot because it is not, it is defective. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, that's not how God created us. He didn't make us a copy of another person. He did not make you, he didn't make you a replica of another person. You are just unique. How great God is that he created everybody unique in their own way. He takes his time to design everybody according to intent. That this person's fingerprint, this person's thumbprint is not the same as the other person. Everyone is carefully designed. That's why the Bible says that you are wonderfully and fearfully made. You are intrinsically unique. How God designed you in your DNA code is unique. You are not like anybody else. So it is actually a defect. Now, watch this. It's a, it's a malfunction when you are trying to be like somebody else. It's a defect for you to look at someone else and say, I have to be like them. I have to talk like them. I have to walk like them. I have to think like them. I, I have to make the shape of my nose look like theirs. I have to make everything, anything about me just conform to that person. That's a mal malfunction because that is not your original design. God didn't design you as a copy, or as a carbon copy of another person. You are designed in a unique way. So when we are trying to duplicate or replicate another person's life in ours, we are actually in an error. We are actually in error. When we try to look at another person and make them the yardstick, the measuring stick, the template, and the model for our lives, we are in error. What the purpose of others, the role others are meant, other people are meant to play in your life is to inspire you, not to determine your legitimacy, not to determine your authenticity, but to inspire you. But what do we do? Most times, we compare ourselves with other people and we start measuring ourselves and then feeling that we're falling short when really, what are you falling short of? You see, divine destiny and plan is not meant for comparison. <laughs> divine destiny and plan is not designed for comparison. God did not design you as a comparative comparative tool or as a comparative being to another. No, there are not 10, 50 or 20 shades of you out there. No, you, there is no one like you. Wow. 
Somebody needs to get that in your spirit. There is no one like you. You are unique in your own way. There is no other, I, uh, there is no other, my name is Yemi Adelaide. There is no other Yemi Adelaide on the surface of the earth. How unique. That's what you need to tell yourself every morning. That there is no more, put your name in that gap. Let's do that exercise right now. Put your name in that gap and say, there is no more, yes, there is no more you. There is no another you anywhere in the world. Doesn't that make you feel special? That God deliberately, intentionally designed you unique. <laughs> I'm going to be sharing a few things with you that I know is going to set you free because, look, it's time we got free. We set ourselves free. We are set free of this comparison chain because comparison is a chain, is a trap, it's a web that you don't need in your life. <laughs> you are so unique to the point that you don't actually need to compare yourself. You can draw inspiration, but you are not designed to compare. You are not designed as a comparative tool. Oh, thank you, Lord. So that's how the purpose and intent of God is for your life, not to compare. They may inspire you, but not to do a contrast, a contrast and a comparison to the point where you are finding yourself, asking yourself if you measure up or you don't measure up. Measure up to who? To whose standards? To what standards? First of all, you have to understand that identity is not a feeling. So, if you, if we, mo many times we think of ourselves, we define ourselves by how we feel. So, I don't feel like this, so I'm not like that. I don't feel like that, but I'm not like that. Be because, but I feel this way, so I must be this way. I feel this way, so this is who I am. Seriously, let me make an argument. If identity was a feeling, okay, watch this. I used to have a, a Mitsubishi that, I had a Mitsubishi car that would not start in the morning. And, oh yeah, I used to start, I just get in uh, the car and go to wherever I'm going, but... There came a point he wasn't starting, and I would try everything, and it wouldn't start, and then, but then if I pick it up a jumper cable and put it on the battery and use another car to try to jump start it, then it will start, and then I can go. But the interesting thing is that after running the car for 10 minutes, when maybe I stop at a gas station, then it will start. Then... Eventually, for the rest of the day, it will start. So the problem was only in the morning. Many of us are familiar with that kind of things happening once in a while with our cars. Now, imagine that car was a person. It would tell me how it's feeling. And it would tell me, I don't feel like starting this morning. The car would tell me that I'm not an early starter. I, I just, I, I'm usually a slow starter. That's how the car feels, okay? The car is not lying. That's how the car feels. I, am, I'm, I think I'm a slow starter. I usually start slow, but that's me. That's just me. You know, that's what many of us do. We, we define ourselves by how we feel. But guess what? Mitsubishi did not design the car to not start in the morning. Not starting in the morning is a defect and a malfunction, not the intention of the manufacturer. So if the car defines me, it defines itself. If the car defines itself as a slow starter, I uh, usually my day is like that. It's, you know, man, that's how many of us talk. Usually that's that's how I am. You know, my day is usually slow. I'm not I'm not good in this. I'm not good in that. Oh, I don't feel good about this. So I must not be this or that. If identity is based all about feeling, then we are just how we feel then that Mitsubishi car of mine is just how it feels. But that's not the design of Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi didn't design that car to not start in the morning. That's a malfunction. 
Many of us define ourselves by a malfunction, and we think it's an identity. It is not an identity. It's a malfunction. And if we will understand, if we then if we're going to understand who we are, identity cannot be understood outside the intention of the manufacturer. Identity cannot be understood outside the intention of the inventor of the product. <laughs> and then, so that tells you then that before you define yourself by how you feel, you need to ask yourself, you need to caution yourself and bring yourself back to how God intended you to be, who God created you to be, because how you feel is not who you are. Seriously, how you feel cannot define who you are. You are who God says you are because he's your designer. He is your manufacturer. He is your inventor. He is your creator. Your creator's intent is who you are. The whole purpose of comparison is to see if we measure up or not. But the question you have to ask yourself is, measure up to what? Measure up to who? Are we supposed to be measuring up to something that was not designed as our yardstick? Are we supposed to be measuring up to something that wasn't our original design? Why should a sedan car, uh, a, a, a Toyota sedan car, should be measuring up to a Ford truck? They are designed for different purposes. A truck is meant to move bigger items and goods and, and all of that used for goods and services, while the sedan is for us usually for, for family car purposes. So it's two different designs. And purpose always comes before creation, before, uh, 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 in fact, purpose determines creation. Because when, when a manufacturer wants to make a car, they ask themselves, what are we going to be using it for? For this purpose, functionality, okay, so let's put this kind of tires, let's put this kind of wheels, let's put this kind of engine, let's put this kind of features. My goodness. When God was designing you, when, when God was designing you, intentionally chose the features he wanted you to have. When God was creating you, he carefully chose the features. Because those features, my goodness, are exactly not a mistake they are exactly connected to your purpose so the features your physical features are connected to your purpose your internal features your the features of your mind your cognitive features are my goodness uh, uh, do you know that nobody no two people ever think the same i was listening to a a uh, 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 quantum physicist speaking the physicist speaking the other day, and they were saying that no, no two people are wired to think the same. And in a, in a layman's time, if I were going to explain it, that's practically saying that the way our brains are wired is a whole different code for every person all over the earth. We don't process information the same. We don't view things the same. The way we think, the way we process our thoughts, is like similar to our fingerprints according to a quantum physicist it's never the same when we interpret when we react when we process thoughts we process differently one person has a whole unique code different from another person from how they think so god designed you intentionally to think differently you are not odd <laughs> because you think differently then your friends and your brothers and your siblings and even people that you work with, it's intentional. Everything about God is intentional. He created you intentionally. He designed you intentionally. He framed you intentionally, wired you intentionally to think different, to talk different, to walk different. Why are you trying to be like somebody else? If God wanted you to be like that person, he would have created you as that person. But he created you intentionally to be who you are because that's who he wants you to be. So it's a malfunction when we compare ourselves to another person and then we conclude that we don't measure up. Measure up to what?
What are you trying to measure up to? What God did not intend you to be in the first place? That is not God's intent for you. So, uh, comparison in the first place comes from not measuring up. And if they were in layers, let's say comparison is a, comparison is the first layer, uh, not measuring up is the next layer, then you go down, then you'll be shame because we feel ashamed that we don't measure up to certain standards and we, want, we don't want to feel ashamed, so we want to measure up to a standard. And when you go down go and, and go down several layers, you find that at the base of it is, is Satan. At the base of it is the devil. It's the, it's the Adamic nature which he got from Satan that makes man by default to be ashamed of what is not supposed to be ashamed of. I don't want to get into that, but most importantly, we must understand the root of our problem if we are going to be able to attack the problem. It's a design problem. You were not designed to compare yourself with anybody. Like I said, it is for inspiration. When you see other people doing stuff and you love it, it's supposed to inspire you to bring out what is unique in you, not about them. When you see somebody doing something that they are designed and they are, they are purposed to do, it is supposed to inspire you to bring out what you are also designed to do. To do. It is not for comparison. Divine destiny is not for comparison. Comparison is an error. Compra comparison is a breaking of the law. <laughs> when God designed you, he didn't intend for that. That's why he said in the Bible, they that compare themselves with themselves are fools because it is unnecessary. Let me give you an instance and a scripture. So the children of Israel come to um, Samuel and they say, give us a king. Let me read that scripture. It says, then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Rimmer, saying, Give us a king. You are old, and your sons are now uh, walk, not walking in your ways. Make us a king to judge us like other nations. Can you see the problem? But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. This is sad. It's sad because this way people that God chose uniquely, unique, this way people that God chose in a unique way, called out in a unique way, framed out in a unique way, and wanted to lead in a unique way. But the problem is that the First of all, if we're going to identify it, it's in them having interactions and comparing themselves with other nations. They must have gone out of town and seen how the king is treating the other people from another nation and how those people talk about their nations and all of that. And they knew that something was unique about them, something was strange about them, something was different about them. But instead of them to embrace the difference, instead of them to embrace what's unique about them, Instead of them to embrace what was special about them, they thought that they had to be like other people. So this problem started from comparing. It started from comparison. So what ultimately, now watch this, what ultimately snowballed into rejection of God started with comparison. So comparison eventually led to rejection of godly leadership, which eventually led to rejection of God. And God then had to say to Samuel, they are not rejecting you, they are rejecting me. <laughs> now watch this. Comparison, and the, when you compare yourself with people, or other people, and other things, and you then have, deeply feel a need to behave like them, Deeply feel a need to act like them. Deeply feel a need to measure yourself with them. Deeply feel a need to be like them. You are taking God off of the throne of your life and are enthroning another person. It's that real. Wow. So we can say that 
Perizin is the enthronement of God and the enthronement of somebody else in our life. Yeah, because Christ is the only one that God has called you to be like. He has created you in his own image after his own likeness. And there you are comparing yourself to another person who he has not, who's, in, in whose image or likeness he has not designed you. So it's, it's, it's the enthronement of God and the enthronement of something else. My goodness. And lots of times it is out of the pride of life, the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes and the pride of life. We want to have what somebody has. We want to be where they are. We want people to acknowledge us in the way they acknowledge the person and all of that. So then we begin to use other people's life as a recipe for our own lives. If God wanted another person's life to be the recipe for your life, he would have already, he would not, he would not have needed to create you in the first place. He would have made that person a copy, several copies of that person. If God intended another person be the recipe for your life, God would have not needed to create you. He would have just created several copies, several uh, uh, variations of that person. That's, that's what would have happened. But God made you unique intentionally. So the children of Israel were basically rejecting God by rejecting God's authority, rejecting God's... Uh, re they were rejecting God as the... apps. When they did that, they were rejecting God as the final authority in their lives. When they did that, they were rejecting God as the absolute king over their lives. My God, when you reject, when you are comparing yourself to, with other people and wanting, trying so hard to be like another person, you are actually rejecting God's authority in your life because he is your maker. He's the one who made you intentionally and you are practically just going off of his purpose and plan for your life. So if you are going to fulfill God's plan, if you are going to fulfill destiny, if you are going to walk in the purpose and plan of God for your life, you must realize that God comes first. His thoughts about you come first. So you must stop appointing other kings <laughs> other than God in your life. God is sufficient for you. God is your sufficiency. He is your master. He is your savior. He is your king. He is your everything. And if you are going to follow him, he would make you exactly to turn out the way he intended. But first you must enthrone him and make him king because he is king. My goodness. Don't choose for yourself any other king. He is more than enough for you. Imagine what you would be if you got set free from the spirit of comparison. Imagine how your life would turn out if you, because comparison is a web. It's a, it's a chain, it's a trap, it's a pit. When you fall in that pit, you become miserable because you're trying to be like what you were not equipped for. You're trying to be like what you were not designed for. You were trying to be like what you were not what the intention was not concerning your life. So it's a pit, it's a web, it's, it's, it's a lot of suffering, unnecessary suffering, comparing yourself with other people when you could have just embraced yourself, embrace what's unique about you, embrace your design, embrace your uniqueness. Oh my goodness. And know that God did not make a mistake when he made you. He designed you meticulously, articulately in every way. He, went, he articulated the process of your creation that he, he knows the very number of a hair on your head. How meticulous, how more meticulous can one be? My goodness. He is so meticulous. He knows the, the very hair of your head. He knows exactly how many they are. My God. He knows how many strands of hair are on your head. Check this out. There was an instance where the state here in the U.S., the state of Mont Montana, took off the speed limits off of all roads in the state. So you're driving the state of Montana, no speed limit. No speed limit, just drive to your discretion. Oh yes, it was an experiment. And people said, oh, this is gonna happen and that's gonna happen. Wow, that's insane. 
and all of that. But it was, it ended up being a paradox because people thought that the rate of accidents was going to go up high up there and then that people were going to die and all of that. But in retrospect, when they took a study in those four years or five years, I can't remember, but they found out in that period that the rate of death, deaths on roads, the rate of accidents on roads actually went down. It was a paradox because people imagined that something else was going to happen, that that was not how people thought it was going to be, but that's what turned out. Turns out accidents went down. Why? When they did a survey and said they found out that people actually took more responsibility. People, everybody kind of imagined that somebody out there is going to be over speeding and they are going to be reckless on the road and I better protect myself. I'm not going to jeopardize my life or my family. So people didn't, people started taking responsibility and as a result, the rate of accidents went down in those periods. And when the speed limits were uh, re stated on the roads when they put back speed limits on the road, accidents went up again. Imagine, imagine how life would be if we took off the speed limit out of our minds. <laughs> imagine how life would be if we took the li speed limits off our imagination. Imagine how life would be if we took the speed limits off our thinking. Imagine how life would be if we took speed limits off of our mind and just take responsibility for our lives. So what happened in Montana? People took responsibility. So things changed when people took responsibility. Wow. Nobody left the responsibility to the government anymore because there's no speed limit. My goodness. Nobody left responsibility on to the neighbor anymore. Everybody was careful when they're driving, paying attention to their side mirrors and their rear view mirror just because now we have to take responsibility. My goodness. People took the initiative because now they can't count on somebody else. They, have, they are responsible for their own safety now. So they took responsibility. How life would be if we all took responsibility and understand that God has done, his, his work is finished. He has given us all things in Christ through Christ Jesus. All good and perfect gifts is given us through Christ Jesus. But how the Bible says his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through what? Through the knowledge of him uh, who called us into glory and virtue. My God. A lot of the things we are expecting God to do or that we say we are waiting on God for. God is actually waiting on us for those things. That we will take responsibility. We will take his word and put his word to work. <laughs> we will put his word to work and see results. A sense of comparison is always giving off the initiative. Do you know what comparison does to us? It gives the initiative over to somebody else to determine our joy. Comparison gives the initiative off to somebody else to determine our feelings, to determine our joy, to determine our landmarks of our lives. <laughs> you need to determine the landmarks of your life and the speed limits are off. Let me tell you, God has taken off all limits. There are no limits. God has put you in the best position you could ever be in Christ Jesus. He has put us in the place of authority. We are jointly seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above principalities, far above powers of this earth, far above any form of dominion on earth because he has restored your dominion. When he died and rose up again, he restored you back to the place of authority that Adam lost in the Garden of Eden. There is not more for God to do. He's given us his word. It's up to us to take, his, to take him at his word and take his word and apply it. Take the initiative 
of taking the word of God that God has given you to prosper and apply it. Take the initiative that God has given you in his word for good health and apply it. It is up to you. It is up to you. There are no more limits. There are no more limits. When you think of this year, think of the year, think of it as a year of no limits. And for not just for this year, but for the rest of your earthly life, God has put you back to where you need to be because Christ has died and rose again. Therefore, you now have power. You now have authority and God expects you to take him at his word. My goodness. God wants you to take him at his word. My goodness. God wants you to put his word to work. <laughs> hey, God is waiting on you to put his word to work. My, 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 my. For his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness so when christ died and rose again god took the initiative off of the hands of the devil and gave it back to you he restored your authority ha 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 how much more privileged and blessed can you be it is up to you to take the word of god and begin to apply the word and begin to walk in the light of god's word my goodness, your confidence has been restored. Your authority has been restored. Your boldness has been restored. Your blessings have been restored. <laughs> what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? The Bible says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. <laughs> My goodness, comparison is not a virtue or a reflection of the mind of Christ. <laughs> No, uh, God has put you back in the place of authority. <laughs> he has given you back the dominion. Uh, he has given you power. He has given you all that you need. My goodness, now he's waiting on you uh, to take the bull by the horn, take the initiative uh, and begin to walk in the light of his word. Uh, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Uh, hear me? You can do all things. God is able to make all grace. Ah, my goodness. Not one kind of grace. You know, grace is divine enablement. Uh, but the Bible says God is able to make all grace. Uh, every kind of divine enablement abound towards you. So there is nothing you cannot accomplish. There is nothing you cannot become. There is nothing that you cannot accomplish. Get this in your spirit and take off, off that veil of limits. There are no limits anymore. You are, not, you are not limited. The only thing that you're limited by is your own thinking. <laughs> My goodness. You have become the, the co-builder with God for your life. My goodness, uh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, oh, my goodness, you have become the co-builder. Uh, the work of God in your life is going to be accomplished by the, to the extent of your understanding and your cooperation with God. Uh, so don't leave the initiative to somebody else. Take the initiative off of the hands of another person uh, and get on the steering wheel. Let God, let God lead you in the direction to go. God is going to accomplish great things through your life. But he needs your cooperation. He needs you to take off, off the veil of limitations. Take off the veil of limitations. And let go. God is calling you to a higher dimension in him. Because he has a purpose for your life. And that purpose must be fulfilled. <laughs> ah, you are not going to die without fulfilling your purpose. God had an intent when he made you. Uh, woo! His thoughts towards you are thoughts of good and not of evil. He has a roadmap concerning your life. Uh, it's calling you to get on board uh, and walk with him. Uh, 
This is the year of unlimited expectations, unlimited blessings. But God needs you to take the initiative. You've been sitting back for too long, for so long. This is the time. My goodness. No, this is your moment. Don't sit back anymore. God has equipped you. My goodness. God has empowered you. My goodness. God has authorized you. God, my goodness, has released his all the tools that you will ever need, every enabling tool, my goodness.